I think there's maybe some questions and some Q&A, and I will, uh, I, I'm going to start uh, taking those maybe uh, first come, first serve, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get as many of these answered in the next uh, uh, 15 minutes or so. All right, so looks like the, the first question was, uh, what's the threshold PSA after prostatectomy can reliably detect recurrent or metastatic disease? Um, so this is uh, this is a, a controversial topic, and but I think a, a very good question. So certainly if you wait longer and as the PSA goes up, your, uh, your chance of the scan being positive or is going to go up. But of course, the chance that the patient also has disseminated disease and isn't going to respond to salvage radiotherapy also goes up. So what, uh, what I generally tell our clinicians and, uh, and our, our clinical practice pattern has been that if the clinician is going to pull the trigger on a salvage therapy, they should get the PSMA scan first. Nothing's worse than, say, doing salvage radiation for a patient and then their PSA keeps climbing, and then eventually we get a PSMA scan, and sure enough, they had you know a lymph node that was outside of the salvage field. So no matter what the PSA is, if salvage radiation therapy is going to be the next step, probably need to get the PSMA scan first. Uh, uh, again, before uh, just not to have any regrets later. It doesn't mean that the scan is going to be positive. We may not see the site of disease, but we at least know that we weren't sitting on sort of a deal breaker lesion that we just missed because we didn't image. I would say insurances can have problems with, with imaging at PSAs below 0.2 because all the data we have is at 0.2 and higher post prostatectomy. So it is, uh, uh, it isn't clear exactly how insurers are going to cover that, but, uh, but from a scientific standpoint, I think we're justified to scan patients uh, so long as it's before, uh, before the next step in their therapy. And then uh, the next question, uh, can PSMA PET replace MRI for making a diagnosis of local staging? Uh, I would say they're, they're complementary. Um, it's hard to see EPE, for instance, on, uh, on PSMA PET. It is uh, relatively, uh, you know, it's at least possible to see it on MRI. I think PSMA PET is very good for some vesicle invasion. That's a little anecdotal, but it just seems like it's really good for some vesicle invasion. Uh, but what PSMA PET really gets you is, um, is the uh, sort of local regional staging, the, the pelvic lymph nodes that may be too small to call an MR. Uh, and then of course it gives you a, a wider field of view systemic staging. In an ideal world, I suppose we'd all have uh, really nice uh, PET MRs, um, but, uh, but not every place does and not every place will. Uh, so I, I, I do view the modalities as complementary, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense for patients to, to get both if, if that's possible. Uh, let's see. Do, uh, do you try to do initial staging PSMA PET before giving ADT? Again, you know, I guess if the patient's going to get systemic therapy, no matter what, it, the PSMA PET may not try, may not add a ton of value. I, I think the real value of PSMA PET is trying to find those patients who have low volume uh, metastatic disease or local regionally recurrent disease that, that may have sort of salvage options like SBRT. Uh, but if uh, uh, to really get an idea of a patient's extent of disease, I do believe in sort of PSMA PET before initiating systemic therapy, just because the PSMA PET is going to be hard to interpret after the systemic therapy. As, as you sort of saw in a couple of examples, um, the lesions can do all sorts of things. So it is, it's just very hard to interpret PSMA PET in, right after the initiation of ADT. So, so I'd, I'd certainly prefer to have it uh, uh, early, before than, than just have it after. Uh, is there a way to compare the FDG and PSMA scans for progression or response to ADT if a patient has undergone FDG prior? Yeah, I, you know, if a patient's disease is FDG avid, and, and many castration resistant patients will actually have a fair bit of FDG avidity, um, I think you can follow them by FDG, and that's probably a decent way to follow them uh, because their disease is, is going to be from that point on glycolytically active. And so if you if you see that loss of glycolytic activity, I, I think that's actually a good way to follow them. Uh, a combination of PSMA and FDG, unfortunately, mud, muddies the waters quite a bit. So I, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to sort of take the, the combination of the two of them. Like if you saw sort of new lesions on PSMA that, that weren't FDG avid, you know, would you believe them? I, I guess I would, but, um, but it is... Uh, it is certainly hard to follow with both modalities. We don't have great data on following with both with both modalities. So if they if they have avidity on one, I would probably try to stick to that one uh, and and uh, and follow follow them along those lines. 
All right, uh, use of PSMA in initial evaluation of patients found on screen to have elevated PSA and may not do well with MRI screening, yeah. So, so there's a little bit of data on this. There's a, a, a trial called the primary trial from Australia, it uses gallium PSMA 11. And they reported that uh, the PSMA was actually a little bit better than MRI at finding clinically significant disease. Uh, I can tell you my anecdotal experience is that they almost always find the same thing if there's clinically significant disease. I don't, I don't know that I find PSMA upfront as, as definitively better. Uh, although again, the only sort of published literature would say that, that it's at least a little better. In terms of patients that can't get MRI screening, I, I think the, the, the big holdup would be, would be insurance. Uh, I think insurance is, is now pretty cool with, with MRI as sort of a secondary screening modality for patients with elevated PSA, uh, but there are no guidelines that recommend PSMA PET in that context. And in a patient who, in fact, the guidelines specifically say PSMA PET is only for men with prostate cancer. So uh, an insurance company would have a pretty solid foundation to stand on to say that uh, this patient doesn't have confirm prostate cancer or we're not gonna pay for their PSMA PET. However, if, if insurance is okay with it, then uh, I think it can be a very useful adjunct to MRI. MRI is probably still the gold standard in that space, at least in my mind, uh, based on the, the level of data that's out there. But, uh, but it is, uh, for a patient that maybe can't get an MRI, I, uh, uh, if you can't get a PSMA PET, it can be useful. All right, uh, do I have experience with Pazluma and what I consider it equivalent to Polarify? Uh, so uh, yes and yes. So I, uh, I, I've uh, read, I don't know, probably 80 or so Pazluma scans uh, that uh, were done on various trials and whatnot. And uh, my, uh, my experience with it is pretty much exactly as the companies describe it, or, or at least uh, uh, somewhat as they describe it. Uh, there is less urinary excretion than Polarify. So I do think you potentially get a little bit of an improved uh, look at the pelvis. Uh, there's probably a little bit more false positive bone uptake. Again, that's anecdotal. I don't really have data on that, but uh, but my, my observation was I would sometimes see things that I was sure were benign bone lesions that seem to have uh, Pazuma uptake. Uh, of course, I don't have head-to-head -head necessary Pazuma and Polarify uh, uh, scans in, in a, any significant number of patients, but uh, but yeah, my uh, uh, my impression from the clinical trials that were done is that they are statistically equivalent and we should, uh, from a guidelines perspective and, and use of them in, in different indications, uh, we should be comfortable with either one. Uh, can you share your protocol for PSA imaging for Polarify? Uh, do you think the imaging in two hours is beneficial? Uh, another great question. I think that uh, I think that there are occasionally lesions that show up at two hours that don't show up at one hour. And it is possible that uh, it is possible that that may make a difference in, in one patient or another. Um, I'm not, you know, you, you, you never sort of know, there's not necessarily like a big prospective trial that, that has shown that. I, I, would, I would note that two hours is outside of the FDA approved label for imaging with Polarify. Uh, I believe the Polarify label is something like 45 to 90 minutes or something like that. I don't think it goes out to two hours. So it would potentially be off label to use it at two hours, which isn't a big deal, just, just something to be aware of. The, uh, what I think is maybe the more practical consideration is that uh, at two hours, you've used an uptake room for two hours, and that may not work with your pet center workflow because everybody's getting imaged with FDG at one hour. So, uh, so we, use, we use one hour because it fits in with our FDG workflow. And I, I, I think it's an uncommon patient uh, that's gonna benefit from imaging at two hours. If you do have the option though, there, there may be occasional patients for whom that would be beneficial. All right, uh, if uh, PSMA scan is negative in patients with rising PSA following initial, initial treatment, have you found FDG scans be of any value? Uh, no, I, I think FDG only really becomes a value when uh, you've got relatively advanced castration resistant disease. There are certainly FDG positive tumors that occur before that, but they're relatively uncommon. And uh, you know, I, I suppose a question could also be asked, is Axman useful in that case? I, I tend to think not either, uh, because I think most of the negative scans in, PS, in, in that patient population are because of volume of disease, and, and there's no molecular imaging that's going to find them. So, so the question is whether a negative scan then triggers salvage radiation therapy still, 
or what we should do with that negative scan. But uh, I think right now, and, and the guidelines level uh, data would, would, I think, support this statement that uh, PSMA is the most sensitive modality that we have for the biochemical recurrence setting, and that there's no real reason to believe that other modalities are, are going to be reasonable problem solving tools. Um, the one, ex you know, I take, there's one exception, I think, to that. In a patient who may have a local recurrence, maybe they had a positive margin at surgery, uh, dynamic contrast enhanced pelvic MR is a great tool. So, uh, so if you don't see anything on PSMA in that context, uh, a, a, a multi-parametric MR is, is maybe still a great option. All right. Uh, if there is an equivocal transitional zone finding, is PSMA useful to decide biopsy versus active surveillance? Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any data that would suggest that. There, there's, uh, there is data that PSMA PET can make you more confident, kind of in reading the MRI. So I, uh, so if you if you did, yeah, I, I could certainly imagine a case where you've got something on MR, it's pyrans three. You know, what, what do you really do with that? It's blazing hot on PET that you go ahead and biopsy that. Uh, pattern four disease seems to be important for PSMA uptake, uh, at least somewhat, but. Um, but but again, yeah, not, not not aware of prospective data, so uh, so it would uh, again. I think you know insurance issues may may sort of come into play, but uh, but it is it would be it would be a reasonable step from a scientific standpoint. Uh, let's see, anonymous attendee, uh, do you uh, do you recommend stopping ADT for some weeks before doing PSA pad? Uh, we don't. Whatever the patient's on, uh, we figure that's sort of the state of their disease, and and we should go with that. So if uh, if they're on ADT. And they've got a rising PSA, that would indicate they have viable disease and is progressing. It's likely to be PSMA avid, and we should go ahead and image them and, and take a look if uh, if if it's sort of otherwise reasonable to image them. So so yeah, we don't we don't really try to change uh, uh, change anything that the clinicians are going to do. Again, I think it's not always a uh, not always a great idea to to try to scan them right after initiation of ADT because weird things can be going on, but, uh, but we, don't, we don't stop ADT generally. Okay, so uh, pyrite 3 peripheral zone lesion, is PSMA useful to decide biopsy or not? Uh, again, uh, again, I think it, it could be helpful, uh, which again is uh, uh, extrapolating from, from data that isn't exactly in this, uh, in this space. Uh, I think it could be helpful, uh, but I would, uh, uh, I would, and you know, and if the patient has has known prostate cancer, uh, even if it's uh, well, you know, I guess the problem is anybody that's on surveillance is going to have at least favorable intermediate risk, and the guidelines don't recommend PSMA PET in that context. So again, insurers may have a problem with that. They, they, I, I don't, I don't, oh, I don't always know how nuanced they're getting with things, but uh, but I can imagine insurance being being an issue there, and then. Uh, uh, I maybe uh, maybe have time for for one more question here, and I think there's about one more question here. So, uh, are are we administering Cluvicto? Do you think metastatic history of the metastatic men who refused chemo could be considered for therapy? Um, so the problem, the real problem there is that the uh, data that shows that men who are not post chemo uh, and their benefit of Cluvicto hasn't been published yet, and so I, I don't believe an insurance company is going to pay for a three hundred thousand dollar course of, of Cluvicto. Uh, on on that basis, it's really the FDA labels only for post chemotherapy men. So while I think that that we're we're going to move into an era very soon where we're giving Pluvicto pre chemo or in men who don't want chemo, uh, we're not quite there yet. So so we are only giving Pluvicto right now to men who have, have progressed on chemotherapy. Okay, and then you know, one last question. So I, I said one, one more, but we'll we'll do this one. Um, do you handle focally intense PSMA uptake without CT correlate? So it depends on where it is. If it's in bone, um, I look really hard for a CT correlate because sometimes the CT correlates are are very uh, very subtle. They may be like you know something that's maybe minimally expansile that might be a good fit for fibrous dysplasia. Uh, if uh, so, so in, in bone, I think it can be tricky, but if it's really intense, we do have to take it seriously. Uh, if it's outside of bone, if it's in soft tissue, I guess I'm, I, it would be very case dependent. Uh, I, uh, uh, if it was truly out in the middle of nowhere and there's no lymph node around, I, I wouldn't be sure what to think of that. 
Uh, in other organ systems, it, it may require additional workup, like if it's in the liver, uh, that, that could be an HCC or something. We may have to go hunt that down a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, it would, it would sort of it would sort of depend a little bit. And then if it's in the prostate, uh, it's almost certainly prostate cancer, and uh, uh, and that's presumably, I guess, why the patient would be being imaged. Um, and with that, I do apologize. I I, I will going to have to run. I, I know there's uh, there's probably other questions that will trickle in, but uh, it's really been a pleasure uh, joining you today. And I hope this was uh, I hope this was a useful. Uh, uh, a useful uh, uh, talk, and I uh, really thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you for some great questions, and uh, uh, hope everybody has has fun reading these scans. <laughs>